Um, thanks for coming. This is the user X user experience session. Um, my name's Carolyn. This is Jess. Uh, as you can probably tell from the accents, we are both uh, from Australia and we have both been very involved in the copyright review framework that has happened in Australia. So I think the idea is that you could ask us any questions about how things have happened, but more to the point, um, having been through these debates a little bit, um, we sort of hoped to help facilitate, facilitate a discussion around some of the issues that might be relevant um, that will be coming up in the New Zealand copyright review. Uh, so, just a reminder about the Code of Conduct. I'm sure we're going to have a lovely, respectful um, conversation where everybody's going to have their views heard, but if at any stage that you feel that you need some assistance, we have the TUI person over here, Vivian, who um, is available and in the room. She's also going to be helping us with microphone running. Um, the session is being live, stream live streamed, so we do need to talk into microphones so that people could... Um, participate uh, over the web. On that, I'm wondering if there's somebody here who's monitoring Twitter at all who might be willing. Can we ask you if there's some questions that come in through the live stream to put your hand up? That would be fantastic. We also have a document um, that would be great if people wanted to put some observations in. We will do our best to wrap up the session at the end and drop things into the document, but if anyone's taking notes and wants to help with that, that would be fantastic. Um, so just setting the scene just for a moment, the, the term user X, I, I wanted to make it clear that, because traditionally in copyright debates there's been this idea that there's users of copyright and creators of copyright or rights owners and users and some of the copyright debates are framed around that. When we're talking about user, the user experience of the New Zealand Copyright Act, we're really just talking about people that engage with the copyright framework. So you could be a rights holder, you could be a creator. We are all pretty much users and creators of copyright material in a modern age. So I, I think if it would be helpful to use the term user in that sense, what's our experience with the New Zealand Copyright Act and what are the sorts of things that this review should be considering? What are some of the principles and frameworks that we should be looking at in terms of establishing a modern copyright framework that's going to work um, best for uh, the New Zealand context? And really, um, we wanted to do a bit of a show of hands because there's a number of ways that this session could go. Um, but Jess and my hope is that we will come up with maybe some concrete principles that could be fed back into Internet New Zealand to feed back into um, something for the copyright review framework to have a look at. So one thing that we could do is sort of try and get an audit of the things that the people in this room think should be front and centre of the New Zealand copyright framework. That's sort of option one. Um, the other thing that we thought could be a useful discussion would be things like um, what, are, what does a modern copyright act look like? What are the principles that should be um, framed in the New Zealand Copyright Act and, and can we kind of come up with some articulation of that concept? Um, and then it's really your session. So if there's other burning things that you want to talk about, then we'd love to hear it. But as a sort of rough idea, are people more interested in sort of defining and articulating some of the experience issues and some of the things that you see as problems that need to be fixed? Or would you rather have a high-level discussion around what should a modern law look like? So I'm going to put, put hands up if you're interested in more of an audit process of problems that we could capture and feed in that need to be fixed. Absolutely no. No, we've got, <laughs> we've got a couple. Or is there a more of an interest in sort of the, the future, what should copyright look like in a modern age kind of discussion. Okay, I think we're going to start with that, but let's hope, you know, along the way we'll also try and capture some specific issues because I think that's really helpful too. So there seem to be a real, <laughs> I hate to sort of put, put people on the spot, but could I ask you why it is that you thought that was a useful way of approaching things? And if you don't feel like sure. you want to answer that question, I will... I think if someone was in the Maltaranga Māori area, you might have heard me speak already. But um, I think Māori data needs to be a very important framework. And it's, you know, somewhere where we need a platform, we need a group, we need a team to talk and discuss about the development of the Copyright Act in that frame. Um, purely because we have all these other terminologies that tend to go back in time 
when really what we need to be talking about is data on the internet right now and how do we get data on the internet and still keep that Maoranga Māori concepts involved in it. Did anyone else have some thoughts around the types of things that, or principles that you would hope that the Copyright Act would have sort of front and centre? Yes. I'd very much like um, Internet New Zealand and the government, as, ma as a matter of fact, to look closely at the December, 19, uh, December 2014 report by Farida Shahid who was a special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights of the United Nations, who put out a paper called Copyright Policies and the Right to Science, which contains very clear framework, trying to look at the balance of interest between the creators and the users and respecting international law in the process, um, because of some very important points that come through in that which are not respected by our law and which um, also have a look at the same time at some work by Alfred Desaius, who as um, a expert um, at the, similarly rapporteur at the United Nations, had some quite strong things to say about the legitimacy of what we've done in the way of international trade agreements, which have not allowed user input at the copyright level, um, so that saying in fact that what we've done in those trade areas should actually be revised, modified or terminated if it, there wasn't proper consultation in the first place before these um, fixed part pieces of law legislation came into effect. Thank you. So they're both sort of observations about the types of voices that it's, in, it's essential that we are listening to as part of the review. Could I ask just to dig deeper? When, when you said that there were things that were lacking in our copyright law, were there ones that you wanted to highlight as a specific? I mean, obviously there's a sort of consumer involvement piece, but do you, are there particular things that that report draws out that you think are lacking? I think that what's so important about that is really the real care with which the, that effort to try and provide the balancing factors that should be considered is put into practice. They're too numerous really to go into here. I have other feelings as a librarian, but I would like other people to have a chance to speak first, please. Thank you. Mine is more of a negative. Can we get away from the term intellectual property? because it doesn't behave like any other kind of property. It doesn't really pass any, this, the, the sniff test or the duck test for property. Does anyone else have any high level observations about things that we should be thinking about when setting the framework for a modern copyright act? I'm thinking about convergence, about how technology is converging and ways of doing things are changing and platforms are changing, everything is changing rapidly and, and I don't see how the current, I mean the current Copyright Act just doesn't fit with it and it's difficult to see how you're going to get something that's going to fit with the way that things are changing and encourage innovation in science. I work in the university sector, so they're at the forefront of convergence. I went to the Deloitte <coughs> presentation uh, at lunchtime and it gave me great concern in that the entire process seemed to be centric around government fair use. In other words, anything that's owned by the government, education, local government, blah, 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 blah. Um, but in fact, the generation of uh, future intellectual property, if you like, is in the hands of individuals and small to medium enterprises. Unless, of course, Google and Fairfax or Fa uh, Facebook want to own all of the uh, copyrighted, you know. So I really want us to, to 
<coughs> not allow this to go forward without saying, you know, that the private enterprise, you have to think on behalf of private enterprise, because they're often not very good at expressing themselves, apart from interest groups. Um, but that is where the drivers actually come from. I feel that this fair use thing is quite self-centred from the point of view of government, government people who are librarians, this, that. But the people who are actually, you know, uh, the community at large needs to have uh, access to fair use rather than fair dealing. saw a hand, were you? No. Yeah, and it's an interesting one because I think a lot of the debates that have happened, not just in Australia, but a lot of the places that this has been looked at, you know, should we be moving to a fair, you know, staying with an existing fair dealing framework, which is effectively an articulation of a list of things that are at least potentially able to be fair, or a more sort of flexible fair use framework, which is more of a question of, well, we may have a list of things that could be fair, but we leave that list open and it allows that sort of future proofing or, or you know, picking up new uses and having a look at them to see if they're fair. And I think that idea of which of those frameworks is best placed to achieve some of those objectives is something that has certainly come through in a lot of the debates around the world. And, you know, whether or not we should be asking that question specifically in New Zealand is a, is a good one, I think. Here, then here. Um, I guess I would like to see any future policy have a clear basis in evidence for what it's trying to accomplish. I mean, in theory, at least, copyright law has a goal of promoting innovation and making sure that the creators of uh, those arts are rewarded for that process. Um, we already know, well, I think we largely agree that the copyright terms that are in place around the world are much longer than optimum for achieving uh, innovation. Um, and it would be good to see that the other clauses are based around evidence for actually achieving the goals that the legislation is setting out to achieve. So, evidence-based policy? My point was related to that. You asked me earlier what I thought was missing from our Copyright Act, and I think Absolutely, fundamentally, we don't have an express purpose at the head of the Act. And this does enable our MFAT staff um, and MB um, assisting them to put forward propositions which promote business over the general population. And this can be very dangerous when you see things happening, just as happened this last week with Theresa May in the UK, for example, taking out of the ministerial code for parliamentarians in the United Kingdom, um, the responsibility of respecting international law. That's been taken out and she said explicitly that business must take priority. So this is where we are actually suffering in our law because the balance, forgive my saying so, I'm not alone. Susie Frankel thinks so and so do a lot of other international legal commentators that in fact our copyright is balanced in, commercial in, in the interests of commercial interests. Um, thank you. I'd like to um, second the point about evidence-based policy. I'd like to uh, question what the definition of commercial interests is as a group, because it seems to me there's lots of different commercial interests. There's commercial interests on the um, part of copyright owners or creators. There's commercial interests on the part of internet platforms or data engines. And uh, the cynical part of me wonders if sometimes the power of the data engines is being dressed up as a freedom argument when, if I could be so bold, it seems to me sometimes that it's the freedom to interrogate everybody's data to reinforce uh, an already dominant position. And so in, in the back there I think there's a question about uh, the new dominance of the commons uh, by the uh, owners and manipulators of data and whether that's amenable at all to national or nation state regulation or whether that's something that has to be dealt with globally. And just following on from what David, the last point of what David said, territoriality in copyright seems to add a huge measure of complexity. Can we, can we try and move away from that? The internet's not territorial after all. Mm. 
which is an interesting one given the intellectual, you know, property chapters of various trade agreements that we've all signed up to, but it's an interesting one. The the internet, there's no there. Exactly. Um, there's a question at the back, and then we'll come back to the... F that's okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I suppose um, I've been sitting here all day uh, with quite a lot of interest. I'm, me and my company, we're seven software developers. We're a little co-op, and we try to do all of our code open source. And at first, I was really skeptical about the business model. It took me quite a long time to work out how it works. Uh, but um, I have realized like that the amount it seems so hard like far fetched to go away from this now like we innovate so rapidly we move so fast we share so much we leverage each other's work we're sharing stuff all over the world and so i i kind of when i see things like this it feels so it still feels like it's a almost a slightly negatively look at it rather than it like being really opportunistically looking at it, of going and saying, well, hang on, the copyright law, the policy should be about, if it's about innovation, then how does that work? Like, how are we going to, it should be supporting a way of sharing opportunities. It should be like helping people work together, not just protecting each other from each other. That seems like really counterintuitive to me if it's about innovation. This is my pet peeve at the moment, so I've raised it three times today, I might as well be consistent. Um, I think that if we're looking to the future of the copyright law protection, I think this is about humans and machines. Um, and I personally want to see humans protected from artificial intelligence in every way that we possibly can do it. And I do see the power of artificial intelligence being able to author uh, both from a creative sense and a news sense and all of these sort of things. And I've run into one particular battle with Fairfax where they started scrubbing international journalists' names off articles, which seems to be a process of uh, removing uh, journalists from the formula and machines will take over. And so I think that at, right out on the extreme, I would like to see future uh, legislation having significant um, uh, protection for humans against content produced by artificial intelligence because it will just overwhelm us and then Facebook and Google will own it. And I'm going to put the microphone back to the room. So, um, back of the room, I mean. I just want to say, like, on the AI comment, I, I, think, I think AI is very triggering. It means a lot of things to everyone. I would just go and call that a bot, and it's really dumb, like, whereas everyone thinks that AI is really intelligent. And I just want to, like, there are lots of bots. Bots are very easy to make. Uh, like, it would take you all of a couple of hours of a program to make a bot to do that kind of a thing. Um, whereas the machine learning algorithm AI stuff is much more complicated. But even, and uh, in the end, um, my colleague, he uses a uh, neural linguistic uh, loops program to help him write poetry. Uh, so he uses it to spit content out that he then recreates and reforms into his own unique poetic works. And he uses it as a way of augmenting his human ability. It is just a tool. And so I don't feel that we need to protect ourselves from machines. I fundamentally, they are just tools. Uh, I feel like we just need to like, rethink our relationship with them and realize that they, one, they are incredibly limited. Like, they're not going to replace the human condition. Uh, though we can use them to like, make it look like they do. And I think that's where the, complex, the, the real problem area lies, is when a machine can pretend to be human through the internet. And that's the, that's the problem domain to be protected against. Does anyone else have some views either in response to that or something else that, yes? Um, although this is not very unlikely to occur in the near term with regard to copyright review and copyright change, <clears throat> I really do think we should be looking at the evidence, as people have mentioned, the research evidence with regard to copyright. And it's very clear from an amicus brief that was put to the Eldred case, um, as well as information elsewhere, you can probably look on the Lianza um, site here locally for some references to one of the reasons why copyright duration shouldn't be extended. 
Um, one of them being that, um, a key one being really that there should be only a fraction of this time. Now I respect the fact that we have international treaties in place that work on a consensus basis and it'll be very hard to change. But I think we should perhaps, um, I would like to see those who are users, um, particularly people, uh, members of the public like myself who have difficulty getting at the um, licensed database content that may be available to university staff and other researchers. Um, because the reality is you do not incentivize people once they're dead. The difference in life expectancy in the time when the copyright was brought in the statute and was more like 46 years. People now live until 90. If you add 70 on top of 90, you can't correct things that your relatives have said wrongly about you in their, um, fav in their personal books. All that sort of stuff. There's a lot of reasons why we should look at the reality that research indications from economists is that the return on investment is over a very short period of time. It's shown as of, as of the 1970s, it's probably only within a year of, of five years you're going to get the maximum return, and certainly probably by the time of the 14 year, original 14-year term plus 14, you're probably getting at the bulk of those returns with very few exceptions. So I'd like to see MB and MFAT work in the international context. I would like to see them attend things like the um, WIPO steering, um, SSCR to actually represent the interest of those who are non-commercial like the GLAM sector um, with respect to balancing factors. So a Thank New Zealand you. voice on the global policy stage. Yeah. So we're going to go here with the person with the hat. Is, are you Me? right? Yeah. Is it on? Yes. Um, what I want to say is that um, I, I'm agreement with that young fella. It's only a machine. The part is, is the human part of it. And the ethics to that human part will change what we're saying. So copyright is, is, is something that's over here with a machine and with a human being. And how you join that is the issue. And what with the ethics part of it built into it. Um, on, I'm not quite sure of the whole picture, but yeah, it's a big deal. Hey. Yeah, I think some of the global policy debates on that have, have actually been quite interesting because they've come up with a concept um, which I believe started in the UK um, with the idea of consumptive and non-consumptive use of copyright material. And, and an example of that might be if you are reading a book, you are consuming it and you're consuming the message and that human element of it. And then there's the sort of non-consumptive use of copyright, which might be the bot crawling over something and making either a search index or perhaps training a machine learning algorithm to come up with a different sort of output and how we sort of grapple with those concepts um, in, in for a modern copyright framework is something that's been grappled with internationally. Um, there's, yeah, we'll go here and we'll, someone who hasn't had a chance to speak and then we'll come back. Sorry. I do think that the next law is important that it addresses, um, makes it easier for users, consumers of content, to recognise copyright as opposed to, oh, I can download this for free or I can do this for free, but really the whole respect thing for the creators needs to be there um, to say, you know, in the past, pre-internet, you had to buy a book, you had to buy a paper, whatever, but now you can just download it. You know, and there needs to be something in there that, that I, I'm not sure the answer, but, you know, it makes it easier for the consumers to recognise copyright and obviously, you know, um, balance with the rights of the right holders. Sure. I want to pick up on what a couple of people have said about term limits and evidence-based. I think we have to recognise the moral hazard here in the creation of copyright law. And I'm thinking about the Mickey Mouse Extension Act and, and its, its brethren here. Of course, if you own what you consider to be intellectual property, and yet that property is somehow defined by statutes or international agreements, of course you will lobby to get that, that definition made as broad as possible, made as long-term as possible. And we can't just make policy in this space without recognising that a very well-resourced lobby in this space is operating simply for its own um, benefit. People argue both sides. I was just going to say, in terms of the turn thing, an interesting thing that's happened globally that people are probably aware of in this room but may not be, is that 
the, we're kind of coming up to the point where the US would start thinking about another term extension if they're going to protect Mickey Mouse. Uh, so if they're going to do the same thing again. And there's been a lot of commentary around the fact that there's explicit statements saying that the rights holder representatives, the people who lobbied very hard last time, are not planning on lobbying for a further extension. They basically don't see extension of term as being, uh, you know, where the game is anymore. Uh, and I think you guys are very, in a very interesting position as New Zealand because you guys have the old 50-year term, you don't have the 70-year term. Um, and because of the TPP or CTP, whatever it is now, <laughs> um, the you guys are kind of caught in this old debate about length of term and whether or not it's a good idea. Um, but uh, the rest of the world's kind of not moved on, but it's not where the game is anymore. So it'd be interesting to see how hard it's pushed for on your shore, how much people are like, everybody else has this, we want to have the same as them, or how much it is uh, left. I don't know. Thanks. One of the interesting questions around term extension um, in Australia, uh, we had to extend our term as part of our free trade agreement with the United States to go from 50 to 70, which is obviously the, the question um, that's being raised. A number of the Senate committees that looked at that issue raised the concept of, well, if we are going to do term extension, what do we need to do to sort of balance that? Um, and it, are there things that we need to do around exceptions? Are we things that we need to do in terms of, you know, making sure that we have clarity around what rights are protected, what works are not protected? So there's a bunch of sort of other policy questions that go alongside that. And a lot of the discussion in the UK in particular, they kind of use the term copyright lobbynomics versus economics um, and putting the, the economic base or the evidence base behind some of those questions, um, almost getting back to the cost-benefit type structure, um, is definitely something that we've seen emerging around copyright reviews around the world. Um, and, you know, certainly from my perspective, it would be great to see some of those debates um, happen here. Um, did anyone else have another thought about... Yep, absolutely. Um, so I, I'm, I actually have user experience in my job title, so I kind of come at this from the actual literal UX and not a metaphorical UX. Um, the, I think as long as we're sort of putting up a wish list for the, the, the modern uh, copyright, uh, something around transparency and ease of use and fit for purpose, um, it's been picked up a little bit in some of the other comments, but um, the fact that you can create something that is legally perfect and makes all the institutional shareholders happy and at the same time is so complex that no one bothers to apply it in, in real life. Um, and I'm, I'm struggling with this right now because I, I work for the National Library and we aggregate other people's copyrighted materials and try to you know, give pointers to them and we want, we're walking the balance between giving the, the most accurate information that we can um, and not over-representing because it's very complicated. Um, and if there was sort of a legislatively um, clear mandate, and you know, there, there's even an evidentiary base to this um, where you can test how usable the actual statements and the actual real-world applications are for everyday people. Um, so just keep it, something around transparency at the middle. I'd like us to be thinking about the um, the question of how copyrights are enforced, particularly around uh, things like geographical um, rights. Um, you know, the Sky TV effect. You know, we effectively are in a situation where if you want to watch uh, content that Sky TV has a long-term contract around, you basically can't unless you pay, pay Sky stupid money for their stupid backwards technology. Um, in import law, we have a, um, a concept of um, parallel importing. Um, it is not permitted for the courts to protect a parallel... A, a, primary importer against a parallel importer. We don't have the same protection in copyright, in copyright law, or at least in, in the enforcement of copyright law, and we're not talking about the, the law itself, but the, um, the surrounding structure. So I do wonder if perhaps that, if that was 
formally um, placed into the law that it is a uh, it is permissible for a uh, distributor of, uh, or to um, distribute or obtain uh, copyright material via other authorised channels. That that is an okay thing that the the, the courts will not will not strike down. I think to overcome some of the problems I see with our current interpretation of Copyright Act by poor old public um, is to have a much clearer, legally more simply expressed, if it's possible, given the sources on which copyright derives, distinction between a reproduction and distribution right relating to copyright versus a private use right um, I know the British tried this, and unfortunately EU law um, case decision got that one thrown out. Um, but that's one thing. And I think also um, a requirement that when there are any proposals for trade agreements, I think it should be built into this particular act that there should be a due consideration given to the public policy interests um, when any new particular formulation of a principle in a trade agreement is proposed, that so there should be consultation with the public, we should get that right of input into something which affects sovereign rights. And I think just outside the, the actual conclusion of a copyright review and new legislation, I think we should do what the British have done. Their intellectual property office has provided beautiful, simply written guidelines on aspects of copyright so that the public can very clearly see what's involved. I believe that our current government believes that it shouldn't be in that business, it's for us to go consult lawyers, but I think that's where half the confusion and lack of understanding comes. So the public interest in the building part and also public you know, explanation and ease for consumers I think is a theme that is coming through pretty clearly. Um, are there other things that people wanted to sort of include on the list that haven't had a chance to say, the things that you, you know, find copyright as an impediment to or wish that we could protect better in New Zealand that this review should be thinking about? I mean, from the, uh, I'm just sort of going to go back to the innovation piece. Um, you know, one of the questions that was front and centre of some of the copyright debates that have happened in Australia, are there things that Australian companies can or can't do that would help them compete on a global stage in other places where they can or can't do certain things. And use of technology and the capacity to, you know, use the cloud, use bots, use machine learning, et cetera, things like that is sort of front and centre. But are there other things that, you know, people are aware of that, for example, New Zealand companies are, you know, finding that the copyright law is banging up against their, um, you know, day-to-day -day operations? Okay, We've, I was just looking to see if there were other hands, but there, there aren't, so feel free. Sorry, different ideas are popping into my mind. Another one which I think um, we are ill-served in New Zealand by really good coverage of the areas where you cannot um, have immediate use of something under the copyright law. In short, that our licensing schemes have gaps in them. And I think it's really hard to ask people to obey copyright or to pay massive amounts of sums for things when you cannot get an opportunity for a license, and particularly at the public level. It's one thing for institutions with heaps of money with a very big contract with a, a collective society, collection society, but it's quite another, I think, at the public level. And one other final point, <laughs> since I've got the mic, is that if you look at what is put up in the trade agreements and what you've got in differentiation in the international covenants, there's differentiation between formats and forms. And I'm really wondering whether a, a lot of the pressure has come to, for upping things like copyright duration, etc., from people who have a really strong commercial interest in something in which they've invested millions. Maybe we should be asking for a se setting out some or working towards at the national and international level something which really deals with the issue of those who want massive returns on massive investment. In short, feature films, for example, as a format, form films that are commercial feature films, 
and that making a distinction between that kind of thing or infringement of that kind of thing as opposed to something which is somebody's diary from 1984 or something. It was good to hear uh, some stuff there, but I think that for me it's like we're not going to own this. We're not going to be here. So the inclusion of, of, of that knowledge and the millennials has to come together because if it doesn't, there's no ownership to it at the end because they'll be the ones that will be driving it. We won't be here. So, you know, I think that's an inclusive thing that we have to look at. I had something that Carolyn made me think of, um, which was pulling back the, the tech question. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the problem here revolves around how much do we care whether or not the law aligns with what people are doing? And this also comes back to the private individuals. So the, there's a lot of uh, things that are technically illegal in New Zealand. Is that actually stopping companies from doing it, um, from doing things? So technically you can't set up a search engine here. Uh, you know, you can't set up a cloud server. There's no exception that allows you to do the kind of activities that you need to do to do those. Are people feeling restricted to that? Do you think that you imp it, this impacts upon you? Or uh, is it okay to kind of stay in the... Do we prioritise the protection of the rights over, um, you know, stay in the... Uh, the, the what the, There's a specific word where you basically say, uh, you know, don't ask, don't tell type space. Um, so that could be something this room could think about a bit. Um, how, and it ties into this ease of use as well. How much is it really important that copyright law really does align with what people are doing, both on a company and individual basis, and how much uh, is it okay to write laws and let people work around their edges? Right. Um, I, at least from a small tech startup point of view, uh, our, we don't have the funds to like deal with this stuff, so we have a fundamental approach of ask for forgiveness, not permission, uh, and that's just how we deal with it. So we're going to head back down here. On a tech view, and working in the space, um, they're just machines, and, and, and what we've come across in working in a space is that the technology is not a problem. It's way past what you're thinking. Right? It's way past. So I can buy a server that could run all autonomous cars in Hawke's Bay for $30,000, and you can share it. Right? So technology is not the problem. It's just getting everyone in the, in the know, aware of what's around, so they can do it. The Internet Technology Group is, is, is a New Zealand company that is connected in every... Um, region, every exchange. So if you're looking at access, there you go there. Um, they're one of their partners, which is Web Connect. They hold so much data, and I'm not quite sure where people have got the idea you can't have a cloud, serv cloud service in New Zealand. That's, it's here. It's, you know, we're not stuck on the bottom of the island of the world, you know, still with grass skirts and all this other stuff. We're in this age, and we're going to be there for a long time. So, yeah, technology is not an issue, so well, we shouldn't talk about that. No. Yeah, it's an interesting one that's also bubbled through a range of debates globally around people, as you say, people are doing it anyway, but are they doing it technically breaching the law or not? And is that something that we care about? Is it something that matters? Is it something that we should be, you know, should the, the legal principles be reflecting that or... You know, there's a range of issues around the fact that, as you say, consumers are doing things that they probably can't do technically and legally under the law, as are tech companies potentially. We've got lots of hands now. Excellent. Um, we're going to start here because that's a, someone who hasn't spoken before, and then we'll come down here. Um, I think the law should take um, that into account. It shouldn't turn people into criminals because, you know, they're doing things that against the law. And I think even equally important is the fact that if people are doing it, I think there are issues of scale around um, if it is actually illegal, 
there's a certain level you can do and you keep below the parapet and that's fine. But if you actually want to um, innovate at scale and do something that the law doesn't allow you to, then I think that's where it's going to provide a barrier. So no, I, I think it's really important that the law um, takes account of this and doesn't turn us all into criminals. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to say is that the future of law is AI bots that are going to be going through and trawling through everything. So I think that copyright breaches are going to be filed by AI bots. And uh, going back to my earlier comments, I think that this is where we have to significantly be extreme, you know, extremely hostile, you know, to put it one way, uh, to what they're going to do to us. So that people who are individual, small enterprises, individuals who are creating content, not realizing what they're doing, are actually being trawled and trolled by AI bots that are looking to file. And all that has to happen is an, a, a lawyer has to, an attorney has to sign off on it. So I just think that this is one of the things you have to counteract. And then over to here. Um, I, um, I was thinking back over the last couple of years and uh, a conversation popped into my brain of someone came and asked me once about uh, how do we Make a, could we make a system where we could use the BitTorrent network to uh, essentially pirate material, but then people could buy the mat pirated material and pay back the individual people that were part of the production team rather than the producers, the, produce, the production company, so i.e. paying back the creatives through using piracy, um, to which I pointed out that uh, anyone building that system would... Um, have a lot of legal challenges to deal with. Um, but it, it did highlight a f an interesting point um, that I think that one of the fundamental problems, and we've particularly experienced this in New Zealand, is distributions, a distribution deficit or a distribution problem. And I think that you, you can't just approach like legislation or copyright without dealing with like the user experience of the actual copyright policy. Sure. What is the user experience of consuming copyrighted material? That's actually the fundamental problem here. If it was you know, you look at like what's happened with Spotify and uh, Netflix streaming services and like people buy it because it's actually easier than trying to pirate it. <laughs> so, so like I, I don't, I think that gets really important. Like there's a fundamental distribution problem really. And I don't, I think that my ask of any legislation would be how can it best support efficient uh, and as much open distribution channel systems as possible. That comes down to um, Sky and its uh, exclusive distribution has to die. Um, <laughs> on a completely different note, the point that um, uh, Michael made earlier um, about bots um, doing the, the, the scanning for copyright uh, violations, they already do. <laughs> I mean, for years, they, yeah, certainly for, uh, in file sharing, and um, those have been automatically scanned and ISPs receive takedown notices. Now, here's the interesting thing about takedown notices. I ran a small ISP for quite a while. Um, we used to get takedown notices fairly regularly, and our normal process of dealing with takedown notices was basically find out who the customer was, flick them a note that basically said, we've received this, and typically the response we'd get back was, oh, sorry, won't do it again. When the new Copyright came Act came out, our policy changed to we will reply to the email saying, this is how you engage with us to start a copyright notice and, you, and, and, and this starts when you pay the bill. Now, if I was the, you'll notice that no um, note to the, uh, the end customer went out in this later mo model, that is now a paid service. If I was the RIA or whatever, I would be sitting there going, how the hell did that happen? Um, now, We've got to realise that the way the particularly the uh, the distribute or the, the the major gatekeeper organisations have, have tended to operate in the legal space has not so much been by whacking each individual mole, but by basically making an example of people. Um, so I think we need to just be aware of that that model. It's it's the, the we built a, a in the current Copyright Act a model that basically says you have to pay for the cost of running your copyright enforcement scheme, 
when in fact that's not really the way the, uh, the, the, the copyright holders were actually operating. Now we're almost to time, so thank you everybody for your contributions. We're going to capture all of this and put it in a document, but I don't want anyone to leave here thinking, gosh, if there's a document about a copyright review and my point's not on it, that I would really like it to be on here to be considered, is there anybody who's going to live to regret that opportunity that hasn't had a chance to speak? We've had an opportunity. If there's no one else going to take it, you can have it. And I want to do a bit of a summary of the points I think we've Cross. So I might do that and that might spur people to think that because uh, so having done lots and I've done some underlining and stuff like that and tried to um, pull things in. I think a lot of the points today uh, do come back to this basic idea that we that most people in this room are really interested in the New Zealand taking New Zealand take a New Zealand interest point of view. Um, uh, in the copyright debate, representing that on the um, international stage, represented in things like trade agreements, etc. Make sure that you're not just being pulled along. There's also a lot of emphasis today about the rights of the individual and small business, um, basically ensuring that the rights of the individuals are protected against uh, things like AI, but also just that they have rights in their own right and that that is given a primary focus. Um, Tied into that, we have making sure that it, things are easier to apply so that individuals and small business can apply them. Now, we have a little bit of uh, the whole, like, whether or not we ask forgiveness or we want the law to align with what we're saying. I think the message that we can send through to the government today is that at the moment people feel very much that they are just, uh, that they just should do first and ask forgiveness. Uh, and, uh, and there's some concern about that. This is me throwing something in. People might not have thought about this, but the enforcement po um, question and make keeping enforcement proportionate is, and this whole concept of trolling, they all tie in together to this idea of, um, uh, of whether or not it's better to ask forgiveness uh, or have the law that aligns with things because the moment that you do have very ridiculous enforcement things like statutory, license, um, statutory damages and things like that, the whole idea of saying, well, people can just break the law uh, and, uh, you know, we'll deal with it later becomes much worse because the moment they break the law, they could, you know, it increases the sanctions, um, the penalties that they are subject to when these AI bots start trolling um, and finding them out. Um, and then there's a few things in here that are more about how, also, and of course the Māori data, data, which was right at the front, but it does have, a, it did have a session, so hopefully they'll get messages from that as well. But there are a lot, also a lot of just how questions um, in here about how they should be doing this. So I'll try to pull them out into a bit of a list of um, evidence-based things like that. So there's kind of two things. One is how do we do it and the other one is, uh, you know, how, what outcomes do we want, what principles do we want to do? And I think the principal one are probably based around the rights of New Zealanders, New Zealand companies, New Zealand individuals. And the uh, other one will be more about making sure that you consult with people, evidence base, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. We haven't actually heard the beautiful bird call, so I think we do. We can probably sneak in another comment. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a narrow issue, but in actual fact, I think it affects an awful lot of people and it certainly affects the quality of education and therefore the future productivity of New Zealand society. The uh, New Zealand Productivity Commission recently did a paper on um, lamenting the fact that um, New Zealand is not gaining the productivity it would like. And I'd like to simply point out to the Productivity Commission and make sure that um, when the copyright review takes place, a really hard look is taken at section 45, which deals with the educational use of films. This is something where we are really disadvantaged in relationship to places like the United States, um, I think even Australia at this stage. Um, somebody can correct me about the latter. Um, but certainly this is where they have a lead over us because the conditions under which they can show snippets of films or whatever in teaching and education, etc., are so wide in comparison to ours where it's only about being teaching people how to make films. And that has huge limitations on the quality and up-to-dateness of what is taught in easily, um, in beautifully illustrated forms to people who are trying to get the latest form of knowledge. Thank you. Well, it turns out that we have been ultra-efficient timekeepers and we do in fact have another few minutes. So um, 
One of the specific questions that has been raised around the globe whenever they've looked at these sorts of issues about how do we involve the broader sets of voices? How do we involve the types of how uses there? You know, how are we going to make sure that X, Y and Z happens in our Copyright Act? One of the fundamental questions that almost always comes up is should we do that by listing all the things that are okay or that should be allowed? Or should we kind of leave it to a more open-ended, principles-based approach? Do people have any thoughts on that? How, how can we achieve, you know, which of those two models would be a better way to go to achieve some of these objectives that we've listed today? Drop the $30 million question right at the end. Here we go. Well, I hope this year we spend a long time looking long and hard at fair use. Um, fair use just linguistically seems to be logically the broadest option. What we're seeing today is there are key issues like DRM, various other things where we're stuck with the international treaty and no matter how much we write on that whiteboard, it's not gonna change this year. It seems that we do need the broadest base possible so that we can try and moderate some of those uh, influences in our statute book using a fair use approach um, in the hope that if we need to uh, look at our treaty obligations over time, we can do that. And of course, that's a executive action which may, may or may not happen. But I think uh, there is a strong case now for looking at this year whether we need to uh, get a little bit American in our statute book and think about whether fair use is the way to go. Just a very quick comment in answer to your question. It's going to have to be principles-based, right? Because things are changing so fast that we'll just end up with the biggest, stupidest list on, F on, on earth, where, whether it's allowing stuff or prohibiting it. Maybe there's a couple of use cases where I can fair use, this is always okay, and in some cases, this is never okay. Everything in between that, it's going to have to be, right? I don't know. Australia has about 90 or so specific exceptions on top of our fair dealings at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, specific exceptions. There's one that's about, yeah, yeah um, but not a fair use, like things that you're allowed to do. And one of them is about writing on medicine bottles. I think this is one of those cases where you can have your cake and eat it too. I'm saying why can't you have both? Why can't you have a principles-based approach and um, some exceptions? I'm pretty sure the US law has both. Uh, it doesn't just have fair use. And, I mean, it gives a good test to your principles in terms of are the exceptions you come up with, which also provides clarity and certainty to some people who, who might um, fire that accusation that fair use doesn't give them that. You can have both. I don't see that it's either or. Yeah, and it's both in Israel, it's both in Singapore, it's both in a number of other jurisdictions as well. Uh, John mentioned the fee earlier. Uh, it seems to me that if you provide a complaints regime for um, rights holders, which you pretty much have to, there needs to be some disincentive to simply scattergunning complaints about everything. And that's either got to take the form of a fee or some kind of penalty for an incorrect one. Any other thoughts on, <laughs> any other thoughts, yes? No. Very briefly, I would concur that I think you should have a list of exceptions, but you're never going to cover all the exceptions because like 10 years time, what's happening? And if you've got the principles there, but I do think the exceptions shed light on allowable activities and um, not allowable activities. Mm. And it may well be that sort of middle ground of between certainty and flexibility that sort of seems to be held up as the holy grail of modern copyright, if we can find it. And can I say, of course, flexible doesn't necessarily mean fair use. There are other models, not many that have been applied, but there's also you know, fair dealing and things like that. But I'm wondering if we can have a show of hands. Does anybody think here that we should only have specific exceptions? Ah, there we go, we've got one. Does anybody, oh sorry, anybody who's willing to say, does anybody think that we should only have a flexible one? Only have fair use? Does, who thinks that we should have a combination of flexible and specific? Okay, that's a message we can send back. <laughs> mm. yeah. well, capture that on the board. I think I would just phrase it this way. If you're forcing to make a choice, I'd rather have principles without specific exemptions than ex specific exemptions without principles. But both is awesome. Both is great. There's the two. Okay. 
Well, we're going to take that as if anyone else would like to make an observation. Otherwise, I'm just going to say thank you very much for participating. Um, we will capture this into the document and we will give it to the good folks at Internet New Zealand and hopefully they can feed that through. And as someone who, well, we both have, have just been through what feels like about three decades of copyright reform, it can't possibly be that long, but it feels like it. Um, the voices that you're talking about, um, one of the things that has not only been really interesting and effective as part of the debates that we've been through, but also just kind of personally really lovely and really cool is the relationships that we've made by kind of looking at those synergies of people that are interested. So if we're looking at, you know, making sure that the, you know, the important Maori data is brought into the root. There's an amazing group of people in this room that can actually start to have those networks and, and bring some of those thoughts together. So I just really encourage you to do that from a sort of, you know, just even a personal perspective, quite apart from a sort of really good public policy perspective, because it's, you know, how are we going to encourage those voices? Well, most of them or a lot of them are in the room. So, you know, be fantastic. And, uh, in a similar vein, I'm just going to add a call. I'm going to echo the call that uh, Jill McHugh, a prominent Australian academic who ran, uh, ran one of the big reviews of our laws a few years ago, the Australian Library, uh, Law Review Committee's um, uh, review, uh, at our conference a few weeks ago was basically saying, you know, the, her um, guide to effective copyright reform and she said, we do read all the submissions, do write a submission, do keep it short. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I think that here in New Zealand, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier. You guys have a really quite good and effective um, public sector, and you know, and government's model. Um, you might have your own opinions, but it really is worth telling them, even the most minor thing, even specifically saying section forty-five. Like um, when the review comes up, uh, tell them what you think, and talk to each other to try to work out what you think first. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think it's, we can all go and have a bit of a break and then on to the next session. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.